hello, and welcome to Design Like You Give a Damn, live 2012 edition here in San Francisco. My name is Frederica Zip. I'm Director of Operations for Architecture for Humanity. I thank you for joining us today. It's really uh, wonderful to have all of you here. Um, we're also streaming live, so I wish to extend a welcome to um, our viewers at large. Today's first panel discussion is Key Practices for Success in Disaster Reconstruction, How to Identify and Collaborate Across uh, Sectors and Execute Strategies for Success. Um, the moderator for this panel is Clark Manis, CEO for um, Hello Manis Architects here in San Francisco. He also served as the 87th president of the American Institute of Architects. In his role as a design principal and citizen architect, Clark's career has influenced the character of San Francisco's built environment. So please join me in welcoming Clark and our distinguished panelists today. Um, also a quick reminder, uh, AIA members will earn two HSW credits for today's panel session. Thank you. Thank you, Frederica. Yeah, no, I'm going to have to shout here. Um, I think we have a great session. I just wanted to offer some uh, introductory thoughts on this session because sometimes life is about timing. So a decade before AFH was founded in 1999, I experienced the meaning of the word resilience. It was the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. Some of you might remember it as the World Series. In late 2010, the city and county of San Francisco with a population of less than or nearly 800,000 people established a pioneering program called Resilient SF. And although it was created in the aftermath of Katrina, Loma Prieta offered the opportunity to set the stage for it. In late October of this year, Hurricane Sandy again reminded us that we must be resilient. And whether you believe in climate change or not, it is clear that natural disasters are becoming more and more frequent. So I'm very happy to participate in this third anniversary of Design Like You Give a Damn for Architecture for Humanity's broader agenda that involves working with communities in need. But I believe the strategic involvement of the organization in disaster planning is even more important today than it's ever been. And the recent initiative as a result of Hurricane Sandy is one that AFH is ready to take on. I might also say that perhaps the word normal is a new word in our vocabulary. And before Sandy, I would have easily said that it was about the economy but now it's about resilience and communities. And perhaps my experience as a result of the 89 earthquake and having the opportunity to work with one of our esteemed panelists, former Mayor Art Agnes, gave me the opportunity to understand firsthand what that experience was. Sandy is really one of those events that many of us who are alive today cannot remember in our lifetime in terms of what we have done to our communities. But I wanted to start and just finished before I introduce the panelists and reading something from you that I just read that was a result of Arthur, uh, author Andrew Zoli's new book, Resilience, Why Things Bounce Back, and Why I Believe Resilience is Having Its Day Now. And I quote, unfortunately, the sustainability movement, its politics, not to mention its marketing, have led to a popular misunderstanding that a perfect stasis under glass equilibrium is achievable, and that is not the case with resilience. So let me, re, let, let me introduce our panelists from left to right. Former Mayor Art Agnos worked early in his career as a civil rights social worker in city and public housing, gradually becoming more politically active and serving in the California State Assembly, going on to be the mayor of San Francisco and an appointee of President Clinton in the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Quite an extraordinary career. He's now serving on several boards, and he will be able to firsthand talk about his experience as a mayor when the 89 earthquake occurred. 
Diego Colazon, Design Fellow, Architecture for Humanity in Peru. Diego, as a design fellow, has been working for Architecture for Humanity in post-disaster school rebuilding program sponsored by the Happy Hearts Fund and the Sura Group, which benefits underprivileged communities. The program has successfully rebuilt schools damaged by the 2007 earthquake in Peru, and Diego can share his experiences and what that is. And the third panelist, Daniel Wallach, is the executive director and founder of Greensburg Greentown. Many of you know that Greensburg, Kansas was hit by an F5 tornado, and Daniel was one of those leaders in the community. He is the executive director and the founder of Greensburg Greentown, a not-for-profit organization that conceptualized and helped lead the sustainable rebuilding of Greensburg, Kansas, following the tornado that wiped out the town in 2007. And today, the tiny two-square-mile community in the middle of rural Kansas is an internationally recognized model of sustainability built community. And our fourth panelist, who was not able to be here and really would have provided a great voice, but he is doing remarkable work, is Alex Amparo. He's with FEMA, and Alex is a deputy assistant administrator. He's obviously working to help what's going on with Hurricane Sandy. And so that, I want to turn it over to Art. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be here and uh, welcome the opportunity to work with uh, Architecture for Humanity again. I have a great and high regard for the work they do. Um, who's keeping the clock, the 10 minutes that we get? Anybody? Uh, you are? Yeah. Good. I trust you with it. After doing TEDx conferences, if, if you've ever seen them with those clocks that sit there, I am uh, terrified by that. But <laughs> So I brought my own, and I'll, and I'll start it right now so that I'm fair to my, my colleagues. Uh, Clark Manis is one of my heroes, uh, even though he's a lot younger than I am. Uh, as you heard in 1989, which we'll, I'll be talking about today in, uh, from my experiences as mayor, uh, we had a hor you could not see out those windows in 1989 because there was a double-decker uh, freeway there that obliterated the waterfront in this city. And if you have a chance while you're here, take a walk up and down either way, and you will see a beautifully restored waterfront that we're still in the process of planning um, uh, as to what we want to replace uh, that hideous freeway that was put there in the early 50s when we thought cars were more important than people. And uh, he was the person who helped me get the kind of information that I needed to handle the highway lobby that wanted to restore and improve uh, that, that freeway. And uh, I never forget him, and I always uh, acknowledge him. The other thing he's done that is so important is he has, as, as a leader in the uh, architect, architecture industry and uh, the AIA, he brought a new consciousness to disaster planning, which, as we're seeing today, is ever more important. So when I grow up, I want to be like him. Uh, because there is such a great contribution all of you who work in this field bring. Uh, uh, it's just so important. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about disaster and as, uh, how I experience it. First of all, and one of the most important lessons is disaster preparedness and planning starts way before the disaster, way before the disaster, because uh, we can do things with building codes and citizen training that uh, eases the um, punishment that comes from a disaster, no matter what kind it is, from earthquakes to what we see right now in hurricanes. But you have to be ready for them to the extent that you can. And the other thing is you can never be totally ready for a disaster. That's why we call it a disaster, because there is no way to handle it as easy as some accident on the corner of a street. And uh, when it happened to us in 1989, uh, right at the beginning of the uh, third game of the World Series, um, I was pulling into the 
like everybody else in San Francisco, pulling in to go to the World Series when it all happened. And I really didn't believe it because we're somewhat accustomed, as uh, those of you who are familiar with the Bay Area, we're somewhat accustomed to shaking every now and then. And um, I asked my bodyguard when it happened, I was in the mayor's car, and um, asked my bodyguard what happened, and uh, I thought we had a flat tire. And she said, no. She said, I think we had an earthquake, but it wasn't too bad, was it? Because we, the tires obviously absorbed it. We got into the ballpark, and the place was rocking. Uh, I had about 10 police officers come and get me because they knew what I didn't, that the bridge had fallen, the Bay Bridge over here had fallen the upper level into the lower level, and we had a major disaster on our hands, and they whisked me off to, uh, to uh, the disaster um, uh, center where I walked in and asked for the disaster coordinator, someone I'd never met because I was, I was in the middle of dealing with major financial crises. We had a recession then that was the worst since 1930s. We've had a worse one now, but then it was the worst. Um, and a variety of other city problems. Um, and so I was not ready for any kind of a disaster of for coming from nature anyway. And um, I asked for the disaster coordinator because I've been told on the way that there was someone with that and he would have what I needed to proceed and deal with this. And when I asked for him, I was told that he had been taken to the hospital because he had collapsed when the earthquake happened. And I never saw him again. When he recovered from the hospital, he retired immediately, and I was on my own from the very first moment. And uh, when I asked for, well, what do we got? And they, they gave me a, uh, uh, um, a binder that looked like this uh, and, and said, this is the plan. And it sort of felt like, you know, you're sitting in an airplane, a 747, and the pilot walks on with a how-to-fly manual because uh, I didn't know anything about it. I wasn't going to have time to read that binder. So I went with my instincts. And my instincts first said, first lesson, we've got to secure the area that's afflicted. You've got to create security. Because the first thing people do is look at what happened to them. They go outside and look what's happened to everybody else. And if you don't have the kind of security that will reassure them that someone is there to help them and someone is there to secure their property themselves, their families, and all the other things, uh, you're, you run the risk of panic. So security was very important. And I declared immediately a state of emergency, uh, which uh, allowed me to do things that normally aren't done in a democracy. It was a very heady experience in some ways. Um, but it enabled me to call the Army. We had a, a military presence here as well to supplement our police department and take control of the streets. Um, and um, it was um, uh, an, an important immediate event. Closed all the bars so nobody would drink and things like that. Second thing, visibility. The leader, and I'm talking about leadership now because people in a disaster look around and see who's in charge, and then the eyes and ears of everybody in the community focuses on you, and you've got to be ready. Uh, and if you're not ready, fake it, because it's important that they have a sense you know what's going on. And frankly, I was scared too. Um, but I faked it well enough so that people believed that I knew what I was doing and, um, and got around. You see Chris Christie doing that in New Jersey right now. He doesn't know what he's doing, but he's getting around everywhere and reassuring people and listening to smart people like Clark Manis and everyone else who's a professional and doing the right thing, as is Governor Cuomo. Um, and and I, I think they're on the right track there. They're also smart enough politicians to do some of the things I'll be telling you in a minute. But the important thing is that you are visible because you are the leader, and it's important that you are constantly informing the populace as to what is going on almost by the hour. And I did countless um, um, uh, press conferences to accomplish that. And uh, does that look like Six minutes, Diego, already? Or is that just six seconds? No, it's six, <laughs> six minutes? Whew. So you may have to come to the workshop afterwards, and I'll give you answer some of the questions. Uh, visibility is extremely important, as I said. Um, and out of that visibility, we saw people wanting to help. As soon as they're well and safe, they want to help somebody else. And out of that came NERT. 
Neighborhood Emergency Response Team. If you take nothing else from what I'm talking about, and anyone else um, may add to this, but it is the organization that came out of seeing people want to help. You're seeing it in the disaster in the Northeast now. Well, we realized that there was a potential for that that we've realized in this city so that some 15,000 people have gone through neighborhood emergency response training. You can learn more about it afterwards, uh, where people go through a series of workshops, I think five or six, uh, including resiliency training, which is a new addition, so that they can take care of themselves and then go out and take care of their neighborhood. It's under the fire department, and it is probably the most important thing that came out of the um, experience. Got to respect the diversity of your community. You got to know that some people will react differently because of where they came from. For example, in other parts of the world, people go outside and live outside because of the um, uh, uncertainty of the building structures with the aftershocks that come in those kinds of circumstances, as well as being prepared to speak uh, in several languages, uh, as we did with trucks going all over the city to give instructions and updates that were important. One of the more delicate, controversial things is you got to know how to manage help offers. I'm not a big fan of the Red Cross. Uh, when, uh, when I was going through, I think, and the important alternative, I think, to the Red Cross is every, you don't need the Red Cross. That's a little bit over the top, but not too much. I think that every community ought to be ready to manage their own help offers, their own funds. I hope nobody's here from the Red Cross. But, um, <laughs> I'll tell them why. It's, it's well known, well chronicled. But every community ought to be ready to manage their own funds because you know best what your community needs. And so those millions of dollars ought to be coming to your city, your county, your state, and managed by the local leadership, not only the electeds, but the uh, advisory folks as to how you want to spend that money. Because FEMA's going to come in and give you the long-range money, but there are a lot of gaps that are important that you know that the Red Cross doesn't when they come in with their coffee, donuts, and tea, and beds, and blankets. Um, and, and so I had a lot of difficulty with them because they were accustomed 20 years ago. They do better now. They do better now. But you're seeing even in the Northeast there's some complaints about what's going on there. So the important thing here is develop your own helping um, funds to take care of yourselves. You know best. Appoint competent people. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you, you ha traditionally, disaster preparedness planning has been, um, is that 10 minutes? Diego, is that 10 more. minutes? Go ahead, Art. You got uh, a couple minutes. Okay. Um, so <laughs> traditionally, t um, the um, um, uh, people that are appointed in disaster preparedness are not so sharp. They are more these days, but it's the politician puts the, 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 the guy who you got to take care of, you got to take care of him or her, usually it's a him, and, and you um, uh, don't want to put them in charge of the airport because you might kill people there with incompetence, but they're not going to do something in disaster because no one expects disaster to happen on their watch. Many examples on the national level. Brownie, Michael Brown, who was the head of FEMA, uh, was appointed, didn't know what he was doing, he took care of horses. And, and yet, when the, when, the, when the crisis came, he couldn't handle it. In my day, just to give you a funny little anecdote, I was having trouble getting home the FEMA director, whose name um, was um, Robert Morris. He was a, a, a bankrupt uh, steel company executive who had run for Congress and failed. And so President Reagan took care of him by putting him in charge of what was then FEMA. And George Bush carried him over. And so when I was trying to get a hold of him, I couldn't get a hold of him. I could not call him on the phone, day or night. And I happened to be on the um, um, Larry King live show, um, and uh, he was on. So <laughs> you know it's coming, right? So I said, hey, Larry, on live TV, national program, I said, hey, Larry, do me a favor. Would you get his home phone number? Because I can't reach him anywhere. And he said, oh, of course, we've tried, we're talking. No, 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 I can't get you. What's your home phone number? And Larry, get it for me. And he did. And uh, I called him, and I got a different response from then on from FEMA. So you have to uh, be aggressive. And that's one of the mistakes, I think, that Ray Nagin made in New Orleans and Governor Blanco, because they were too trusting instead of aggressive in going to get what they needed for their community. They believed the rhetoric. 
And you can believe it, but you got to verify and confirm it's coming by being uh, very outspoken uh, in public if you have to be. Sp last uh, three things. One, healing, very simple. After the disaster, we started a healing program where we had people write their stories, tell their stories, record their stories so they could get it out and talk about what their experiences were. And they're in our, in our library, especially the children in all of the schools uh, who wrote and drew what they experienced so that they could heal as well as record some of the history on a personal level um, to, uh, to give us instruction in the future. I think that you have to be, and the last thing I'll talk about here is spontaneous flexibility and creativity. Uh, a disaster is an opportunity to really do some new things in your community, to put things back better than they were before. And that's what we did with the Embarcadero Freeway and a number of other places where I can take you to in this city where we had slums where there were freeways. We took the freeways down and they are now the most attractive areas in our city to visit. One of the important things we did during the earthquake, because I had been in politics a little bit, even though it was my first term as mayor, um, I knew that when the disaster was over, there'd be another one in a couple of weeks somewhere else, and that would get all the attention. So I wanted to lock in everything I could for my community. We created a, I created a SWAT team where I took my finance people, the money folks, and I said, I don't want you to pick up a stick after your own home is okay, because I want you to document every bill, every dollar, wherever we spend it, so when FEMA comes in, questions this, that, and the other, we've got it locked in. And as a result, we got more money than any other city in, uh, in that disaster because we could document um, what our expenses were. Uh, very important point. I'll see you afterwards out of respect to my colleagues if you have any questions. Thank you. Well, uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you, Art. Um, and well, the first time I, I knew I was going to be part of this uh, workshop session, I, I asked myself what, what are the best practices for post-disaster reconstruction. And af after a lot of thinking and a lot of coming up and down about what are good practices, uh, I realized that there's not a straight answer to, to that. So what I'm going to do uh, today is going to show you a perspective uh, of what happens uh, from the field work. Uh, I have been working in, in Peru and Mexico uh, by, uh, by rebuilding schools that have been affected by natural disasters. And I want to give you a t two perspectives of how we approach these projects under the same program. Uh, we collaborated, uh, we Architecture for Humanity collaborated to build these schools. So uh, the first case study I'm going to show you is in, in Peru. Uh, you might remember that uh, like five years ago, there was a very strong earthquake that affected the, the southern Peru in the Ica region. Uh, many communities were totally devastated and they, have, they had a lot of reconstruction to undertake in these places. And in terms of the schools, many of these schools like, uh, were very damaged, so the children have to, to leave the, the buildings and, and couldn't have uh, classes there anymore. Well, this is an example of one of the schools in Ica. Uh, what is really sad about this is that some of these buildings are not that old. This one was from, was built uh, on 1997. So it's quite a lot of waste of money because you have to rebuild it uh, because you, you had a, a really poor construction uh, and bad monitoring during that stage. So it's a really bad thing to happen. And I also want to mention that the, the gap after immediate responders leave the country and permanent reconstruction starts, it can take many years. Uh, and that, that's something that is really, uh, really difficult to handle in Peru because countries like this can take like from five to 10 years to fully recover from, from earthquakes. So I wanna describe a little bit how we approach these projects in Peru. <coughs> what we wanted to do is like work uh, very close with the community, like in a very bottom up approach in which the community takes a important role towards the project implementation. In this uh, model, we, the municipal government wasn't really involved in, in decision making or, or project implementation, but they were following the project in terms of the municipal normative. 
And the, the, there's always an entity that is in charge of uh, a school reconstruction after earthquakes or, or the public infrastructure entity for education. And in this model, they didn't really get involved in the project implementation, but they were like following the, the normative and the public, uh, public regulation for school building. And obviously the relationship with the school was basically monitoring like the process and not really getting involved. Uh, well, as I said, we wanted to make a, a very participatory design process for this decision making and, and design. So we work closely with the communities in a, a couple of the sanctuaries, uh, other, other kind of activities in order to let them, let them have a voice and understanding of the, pro of the projects. For us, it was also a very good opportunity to learn about their, their priorities, their needs. Uh, it's very important that they, they show us what, what are the resources that they can have. And it also was very, very important uh, for, for them, to, I think, that they, they could like, learn about their own resources, learn about how to work together. In this sense, they developed a few activities. For instance, this was uh, after the demolition of their old school. They, they gathered together in order to, to recycle uh, construction materials, and it was like a community-based organization, uh, and, and we were like re really just uh, monitoring the process, but they were the ones that were implementing this. And of course, we tried to, to uh, have some local identity into the buildings. And one of the opportunities that we found out during the participatory design process is that the there was a very huge opportunity to work with uh, local materials and vernacular architecture. Uh, in Peru, I mean, some of these materials are not uh, seen as like, as like proper materials, but we, we try to like make a, a like, uh, like some kind of advocacy in order, in order to show that these materials can be a good source of, of, of design. And I want to show you this picture because it's a, uh, it they, the community drawn this, this picture for the opening ceremony. And well, I think it's a, a good uh, way to show us that they have taken in, uh, the project into their own hands and they, they are providing a sense of ownership into the project. And this is the actual school, how it looks like from the picture. And this is another school that we work in the same area in, in Peru. And I just want to highlight that during this process, we wanted to make sure that the community is uh, very much involved in the, in the project and from the early stages, and they can take a, uh, the project into a different level. So now I'm going to show you uh, how we work in Mexico, which is a slightly different approach, but it's for the same program, for the Happy Hearts Fund and Sura Group. Uh, we work in the states of Tabasco and Veracruz. Uh, if you might remember that they had a really uh, bad flooding uh, a few years ago. And even if nowadays, they, I mean, this, this kind of floodings, each year they have a, a very strong rainy season which have some floods. And even nowadays, uh, they don't have, a, in the international news, they don't show it anymore. Uh, many communities have to deal with uh, inaccessibility to their, to their houses. And in terms of schools, they, those uh, schools have to be like emptied from two weeks to, to three months. So this provides a sense that this is a temporary school. It's not a permanent school. So that can be a, a problem too. So I'm going to explain you a little bit how we work uh, again with these uh, projects. We have a slightly different approach, but the same results. Uh, we work very close with the entity in charge of public infrastructure for education in, in Mexico. I just want to highlight that this, this entity in Mexico is, is very strong. I mean, are, they have a, a very strong team for, for working for the project. And, and they also have a, a lot of resources. So that was a good uh, advantage for us to work with them very closely. And obviously, they, the relationship with the school was uh, providing like the public normative for the, for the project. And on our hand, we were like uh, uh, in charge of making sure that it was the social management was addressing the project, and of course the project implementation. <coughs> In this uh, scenario, well, the local government was basically monitoring the process, but wasn't really involved in, in project implementation. And 
explaining a little bit about the, how we deal with the project. Well, uh, actually, we were very lucky to have very proactive communities. They were really involved into the, into the, in, into making sure that the school was going to be built, and they even got the, the land, uh, the land donated by the, by the different persons from the community, and even some decision, uh, even some uh, landfill works in order to increase the height of the, of the school, uh, so you can have a safe school that's not a. Uh, uh, flooded each year. On our hand, we wanted to make sure that uh, the project was context related, so it was really addressing the, the existing community. So we work in a, a few activities uh, and design uh, design uh, processes in order to to de design the exterior works. As you have seen in the previous slides, uh, we have to work with a, a classroom prototype because we were working with the public government. But we wanted to make sure that this uh, new school is addressing the, the local context. And I want to show you this picture because this is from the opening ceremony. And I think it, it, like, uh, it shows us that because the, the public uh, sector is more involved into the project, uh, you have, you, they, they have a different role. They become more like a partner. Uh, that person in the, in the middle is the governor of Tabasco, so of, of Veracruz, sorry. And he's like taking a more central role in this project because they, they become more like partners. No, they're not like just monitoring in from a public from a public perspective. Uh, this is the school that we built in Tabasco, and this one is the one that we built in in Veracruz. And as you can see, they even printed their their logo in the front of the of the school. So that means that they're they are really proud of their school and they're part of the process. So it's slightly different the way they we work here in. in in Mexico. So just to, to finish up this presentation, I want to like, I, what I wanted to do today is like make a, a slight difference of how you can approach projects in post-disaster reconstruction. I mean, uh, in one case we work very close with the community and in another one we were, we, we developed very strong ties with the, with the public government, with the local government. Uh, so I think this is a, uh, are two examples that we could like assess a little bit more and <coughs> during the workshop and, and see what are the, the good things or bad things about these processes and, and what are the, the best ways to approach the, these projects. So thank you very much. Hello, again, I'm Daniel Wallach. Um, quick background, uh, born and raised in Denver, Colorado. Um, due to illness, moved, ended up filing bankruptcy after about 10 years of being unable to work and ended up in uh, rural Kansas where they, uh, Kansas has much more friendly bankruptcy laws than Colorado. So you never know where you're gonna end up and under what circumstances but uh, moved out there in 2003 and had no idea, as, uh, started to feel better, uh, was gonna do vocationally, but I did end up taking a lot of pictures of how beautiful rural Kansas can be. Um, live about 35 miles northeast of Greensburg. And uh, uh, Greensburg, a tiny little kind of stereotypical rural Kansas town, or really rural American town. Established in the 1800s, uh, founded by a guy by the name of Cannonball Green. He was a stagecoach driver. But it, you uh, probably know and will see very fortuitous naming of a community. Pre-tornado population, about 1,400. Primary industry, agriculture. Their prior claim to fame was having the uh, largest hand dug well in the country. And that's disputed by some, but they will still claim it. <laughs> These are pictures of early Greensburg, uh, pictures of pre-tornado Greensburg, you know, very typical architecture, a nice diversity of architecture, really charming little town. And then on May 4th, 2007, uh, average tornado is 75 yards wide, 75 yards wide, 
this tornado was 1.7 miles wide. The before and after. This was one of the early uses of, of Google satellite imagery. So a lot of people in the country and the world, that was their first experience with uh, the satellite imagery. And as you can see, it's very dramatic. Town is about two, two miles wide. And again, the tornado was 1.7. So it just left a little bit on the periphery. Um, because there were no uh, uh, communications, nothing left in the community, over 90% of the town was wiped out. Uh, and uh, uh, FEMA and the National Guard would not allow people to stay in the community, so everybody had to leave. So they had a, a town meeting. The first town meeting following the tornado was exactly a week after the tornado. No idea how many of those 1,400 were even left in the area, let alone would come to a meeting. And so they erected this circus tent. And uh, to everybody's surprise, about 500 people showed up. Uh, FEMA and, and Kathleen Sebelius was the governor of Kansas at the time. Of course, George Bush was at FEMA. This was the first uh, post-Katrina disaster of scope. Uh, so the federal government was very determined to get this one right. Uh, it was also their political demographic, so that was fortunate. And having <laughs> Kathleen Sebelius in the governor's office, there was great political uh, tension. And if I could re recommend anything in a disaster, it's to have good uh, political tension and competition because the resources pour in. So they uh, did establish a, a community. It's really interesting to hear everybody talk about how important community and, and getting them involved in the process is. This was actually a very effective uh, planning process, brought everybody together. Uh, that. Um, and to me, it was an incredible experience of uh, the entire community coming together to craft a collective vision of what could be in the future. And uh, all these different, you don't have to read it all, but all the different elements of the community plus folks outside, uh, including federal and state government, and I would share a lot of arts uh, observations. Uh, it's really important to have the local community take, be empowered, okay? They feel very disempowered after losing all their material possessions and friends and family. Uh, so this is Greensburg fast forwarding about five years. And uh, uh, again, the stars really aligned on this event in terms of getting a lot of support in the community. Uh, it was, Planet Green, which was a discovery uh, sustainability uh, channel, uh, started up at the time, and they followed Greensburg for a couple of years. So they were continually telling the story about Greensburg and really keeping the community in the spotlight. So we had the, uh, the benefit of that. And then, of course, having a focus for making this town a model of sustainability gave the town an identity and something to rally around. You can see the wind farm off in the distance. We often talked about the kind of poetry of having the wind that destroyed the town really help rebuild it. There are about 38 wind turbines in town today. Uh, Greensburg Greentown, our little nonprofit, um, was established to help be an advocate for the sustainability initiative. Um, we brought the concept to town a week after the storm. Uh, but Governor Sebelius' office also had the idea, and the original mayor in Greensburg did. So we really took the ball and ran with it. Uh, this is a map of the different sites in town. We kind of conceptualized the town as being a living science museum, a place where people could come experience sustainability in three dimensions. And it's been very good for ecotourism in the town. It's amazing where people come from to see what this community has done. Just this last week, uh, several communities in Japan that were affected by the tsunami came out to tour and learn and went away really inspired. And uh, there are about 24 different projects or sites that are kind of cutting edge models. This is a hospital. I just love, you know, there's the, 
the pre-storm hospital, very vintage 1950s, um, and this is what replaced it. It's a lead platinum, the first lead platinum critical care facility in the country. It's a really gorgeous project. And again, this was spearheaded by a hospital administrator who had been a nurse, never had any kind of experience with any of this. And the fact that, again, coming from a very politically conservative background, to come forward and embrace this idea of being a model of sustainability was really gratifying and wonderful to be a part of. Um, again, don't have to go through all the details here, but the, the colored chart on the right, essentially uh, you're looking at what if the bu same building had been built with a standard today's energy code, what the energy use would be there on the left, and because they were so conscientious about building back, you see the costs on the right significantly less. They generate a significant amount of their own wind power with two uh, turbines. Uh, BTI, the uh, John Deere dealership, anybody who's had any experience in rural America knows that John Deere is an icon, a cultural icon. And to my delight and amazement, I really thought they were going to be our biggest challenge. And they ended up being our strongest advocate. And they built back a lead platinum metal building, which was no easy feat. Um, City Hall used bricks uh, from the downed power plant and a number of other features. And you can go to our website at greensburggreentown.org if you want to see the tour book, and it spells all of this out in great detail. The school, it's a gorgeous, very well daylit school, uses very little artificial light, and it's just a wonderful place for kids to learn and to thrive. The courthouse actually had a car come through the roof, but instead of demoing the building, they decided to try to make it a model of sustainable uh, um, historic preservation. And they achieved lead gold. It's a beautiful building. And uh, again, wind power, very interesting, challenging time for a very politically conservative community to get away from coal because that's all they knew, and that's the, what the political infrastructure was kind of invested in. So that was a big success for us early on, as the town had articulated that they wanted to be a model. We were able to say, you be a model if you're burning coal. And so they figured out a way uh, to get um, uh, community wind farm. It's actually privately owned, but they contracted with the city to provide all the ci uh, city's power needs for 20 years. So um, it's really quite remarkable. Encourage folks to come out and visit. And um, we'll be talking afterwards at the workshop. And I guess we're going to do questions now. Thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> so um, I, I know after the panel, you'll have some time to talk to them. So um, I, um, in listening, I have uh, three questions that I want them to maybe each sort of talk to. Um, and one that uh, I actually heard each of them touch on. And so the question is, uh, how do you believe that every American will engender resilience thinking as a result of now seeing what happened at Hurricane Sandy? You know, each one of them have seen disasters in their own locale. So, Art, you can start if you like. So how do you think that we can get everybody in, we'll talk about the U.S., to begin to think that this is something. And the word that I use is not despair, but hope, which is really the way you want to turn this conversation around. So federal, state, you know, what are the things that you think will, will get, get more and more people there? Well, I, uh, as I said in my comments, I think that the leadership of this country and the leadership uh, at the state and local level have to embrace the idea and I think we're seeing uh, from the um, comments that are and the and the uh, 
statements that are coming from the leadership that are most affected right now in, in the Northeast, they are recognizing that this is not a once in a hundred year issue. This is a, an every 10 year issue or whatever. And if you look at this country, um, I think it's happening even more often than that around the country. And therefore, I look to the leadership of this country at the, at the top with the president taking the lead to uh, begin initiatives that uh, allow local communities and their states to begin to address what their response to these challenges might be. Rather than just waiting for it to happen and being the victim, you can anticipate and be prepared. And the confidence we've seen in San Francisco, for example, um, uh, through NERT, which I talked about a little bit, but but needs a lot more for you to understand, is that people, when they go through that training and their neighbors know someone knows what to do in there, there is a confidence that is uh, essential when and if, if and when it happens, they know they can handle it. They don't know what's going to happen, but they know they're ready to handle it. And I think that's very important uh, to any community and something that has to become uh, as commonplace as um, uh, the other things we do in communities to keep them uh, healthy and sustainable. Daniel or Diego? Uh, Hola. No, I just want to add, the, I mean, uh, of course it's important uh, strong leadership for, for preparation for disasters, but one of the things that I, I want to add is that I, when I was hearing uh, uh, Art, he was mentioning preparation, and I think in Peru that that was something that they didn't have. I mean, they they didn't have much preparation, and they had to start from scratch. So I think a good leadership could come up with a, a good planning and good preparation for 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 disasters or for disasters. Yeah, I mean, for me, one of the reasons I mentioned my own background with illness is. Illness in an individual is just a microcosm of the macrocosm that are natural disasters. And what works at the micro, I think, works at the macro. And it's about empowerment, and it's about working with healers who see the uh, patient, if you will, as whole, and that they just need to be, they need help getting in touch with their own healing energy and power to come back to wholeness which is very different than the uh, traditional, in this country, to traditional medicine, medical approach that's very top-down, I'm going to fix you, and if I can't fix you, you can't be fixed. And oftentimes, they attempt to fix things um, with temporary fixes, and so they come back, cancer being one good example. So I think it's all about empowering those that have been affected and, um, Last thing I'll say about that is there's tremendous power in, in making something beautiful out of something tragic. We all know that. And if you can help people vision how they can bring beauty out of disaster, then you're way ahead of the game. So it's, um, it's a little bit more than two weeks after Sandy, and I'm going to ask this question, which I know has been in a lot of different articles. So. How do we decide where to rebuild? Well, um, well, I, I want to explain a little bit my, my experience in Peru. What, how did they decide to how to build? I mean, with a metaphor, because uh, one one thing that I have seen in in Peru is that for education, whenever there's a vacancy for a, for a, a teacher, they they have a ranking of all the best teachers that have been taking the test, and obviously the best teacher goes to the best uh, school. So at the end, you have the, the best teachers addressing the, the nicest schools, the, the, good look the, good, the schools well located, and the rural schools, the ones that nobody wants to be there, they're, they're ha they have obviously the, the teachers with the, with the poorest marks. So uh, what happens in post-disaster reconstruction in Peru was almost like similar, uh, they started like rebuilding the most important uh, hospitals, the most important schools, and at the end, they, they, the schools that, that are not, they don't have, sh they, they're really far away or not really have a great impact in terms like of showing off 
how the rebuilding process is working. Uh, there's their they're, they're left at the end. So uh, what we tried to do in Peru was to, to try to have a community-based uh, research in order to see what, what are the, the projects that could make uh, a greater impact and greater, uh, a greater level of, of uh, empowering the communities. So I think uh, that could be like a good option to, to work from the bottom up to understand what's going, up, what's going on in in, in Sandy or in New York and I work with them. I, I would say resensitize. I mean, if, uh, that to me is the key to healing. If you've become ill and there's causation for it, and there always is, and you come in touch with that, you tend not to re-make that mistake. But if you're not sensitized, you'll keep making that mistake. And so the question is, if we can get communities more sensitized and aware, they'll be less likely to build back structures and approaches that are not beneficial into the long term. Uh, well, there, I don't have much more to add to that, uh, except to say that from my perspective as a leader, um, I think it's important that the leadership of the, the area that we're, that's, that's involved can't be afraid to lose an election. Too many decisions are made because the politician, the elected official, sometimes even the appointed official, is afraid of losing their job. And as a result, they avoid or um, shy away from making some tough decisions. And where to rebuild? When you do the things that my colleagues are talking about that are absolutely uh, essential, which is to involve the community and empower them to make decisions for themselves, then someone's going to have to say, okay, we're not going to build there if that's the consensus, because the barrier reef is going to get hammered every time, and we just cannot afford to ris run the risk of life and, 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 and cost to keep doing this. Um, and, and so uh, when the uh, leaders make that decision, um, they have to be ready to lose because it's not always a popular uh, decision, even though it's the right one. So I'm going to follow up on the next question because Art precipitated this earlier and I think Daniel touched on it. So if you look at the amount of money in probably the last 12 months that FEMA has had to spend as a result of disasters, the real question in my mind is, where is this money going to come from? I believe if uh, uh, Governor Cuomo's um, quote was $33 billion, okay, for a segment of the United States. So this sort of goes to my earlier question about how do you decide where you rebuild? And I guess the real question is, and Art actually real hands-on experience, where do you get that money? I mean, because it's not an endless pot. It's you know, it's you have to you have to make diligent decisions. So I'm going to turn it back to them and see what thoughts and <coughs> I'll start at least. Um, can you hear me all right? You want me to stand up there? Can, um, so so um, it starts with what I said in my brief comments. You really have to be diligent and document every single bill because after the empathy of the immediate crisis is over and there are other things to deal with, inevitably the bureaucrats and everybody involved with responding financially, they start to put the green eye shades on. And you have to be prepared to deal with the green eye shades, not the big hearts. Because uh, the green eye shades usually are what you're uh, negotiating with. And then um, I think that uh, every politician, Cuomo's doing it, he's inflating it because he knows he's going to be cut back. So it won't be quite as much, but the documentation is extremely important. I think that that money has to come from the federal level uh, for the most part because every American has a responsibility, and I think if you put it to a vote in this country, they'd say, yes, I want to contribute to my fellow uh, state or wherever the disaster happens, 
We see that. That's the best of America. I saw it here in uh, San Francisco, this kooky, crazy city on so many issues. But when that disaster happened, we came together and showed the country we were made of the right stuff. No looting, no rioting, none of that stuff. And then they started to contribute to restore our city in the new ways we thought were possible. I think that's the same, um, uh, uh, the same attitude that the, every American has in a crisis. So I don't think it's a big deal uh, to tax ourselves and look for other ways that we might get the revenue to help communities, because we never know when it's our turn. Well, no, I just want to add that, well, uh, you were talking mostly about uh, the United States, but in terms of um, in countries in emerging countries like Peru or Mexico, I think international aid takes a, a very important role. And one of the issues that, that the governments have uh, to deal with in, in, in these countries is like uh, learning to administrate funds uh, that come from at the international level. And sometimes that can be very, very difficult and, and maybe not have the appropriate uh, way to inter intervene in, in terms of reconstruction. So uh, I think that's, well, I just want to mention that. I mean, it's not very related with your question, but uh, it's just one point I want to highlight. Yeah, I mean, this is a huge question. And I, I agree that I think it should be spread out over the masses, but it's kind of like the healthcare debate. I don't want to be paying for people who are smoking and getting cancer. I mean, there's some common sense and there's got to be some sense of responsibility. So if you're rebuilding a boardwalk the same way it was before it got wiped out, I don't want to pay for that. And I, I think a lot of Americans are going to resent that. So there has to be some kind of uh, system to hold folks accountable and, again, make it at the local level. But it's, it's complex. If you vote for me, I'm going to rebuild the road boardwalk. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, two takeaways. I want to just close our session out. Clearly, one uh, is being inspired. Uh, Architecture for Humanity, you all know, really has got uh, this great uh, element as a part of the strategic plan in terms of disaster response. And as a nonprofit, it's always seeking funds. And so that my question is really about where that money could be raised. Um, and the second really is, I think, which you've heard from the panelists, is really out-of-the-box thinking. Um, each one of them have gone into dealing with disasters without the skill set they thought was necessary, but thought through what they would need, use the resources, and I think that's a critical part of that. And, and so this is one of those conversations that will continue on. Uh, with that, I want to close the session. I want to thank our panelists. Uh, this is just a, a wonderful topic for us to be able to start on. And uh, I want to thank them each for coming and, and sharing their views. Thank you.